Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. All right. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. I'm with Talia Williams, who will be jumping long jump in Tokyo. This will be her second games. She was fifth in Rio, obviously hoping for more in Tokyo, but also in 2017 was a world champion in the long jump. And uh, that was in Doha, right? 27 was in London. Oh, 27 was in London. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Well, Talia, welcome. Thank you very much. You've got a super busy schedule. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Yeah. So how are things going? So you, when you won the world championship, you went 527, but at trials mm -hmm. in, in Minneapolis, you went 537. That's so right. it looks like things are trending in the right direction. How are you feeling about your preparation? I'm super excited. The How I did at trials was the best I've ever competed at like a para meet at all. And it, all the meets I've competed in, it's the best I've ever jumped. So that was super exciting to finally be able to jump what I know I'm capable of, capable of in front of everybody or at a meet that where it counts the most almost. So we are coming up to Tokyo. I think I'm heading in the right direction so far. So that is... Um... Yeah. And so, so the thing is, so you, so you do, I mean, you mentioned for a para meet, but you jumped regularly, you were second in the state in high school, and this mm -hmm. isn't second in the state on the disability side, this is second in the state of Nebraska in mm -hmm. high school, and then, and then jumped in college as well. So it's kind of, it was a bit of a change for you to go from competing against able-bodied competitors to competing against Para, uh, Paralympic competitors. How has that change been for you? Do you have to look at it differently? I I do have to look at it differently just because I have really high standards of my for myself. And like when I'm competing, when I was competing, oh, competing collegiately, um, the standards to for me to think that I'm doing well it was a lot higher. And now I feel like I can jump. Not saying that the standards here are lower, but it's, it's a different atmosphere, almost different numbers of different people I'm competing against. So like my bad day is still going to be what I consider a bad day is still going to be pretty good. I think competing against pair as to when I was collegiately. Is it harder then to to get long jumps at Paris? Is it, it like the competitive juices? Are they flowing? Is it a challenge for you to, to say, I've got to throw a really big one out there like I would out otherwise? I haven't thought of it as a problem, but now thinking about it, how I haven't done it yet, it might be, that might be something to look into, but I don't think so. I just, I'm not sure. I know this has been my first year though, not competing. I think a lot, what I had to do is the fact that I had been competing in collegiately for four years and doing para as well so it just made the seasons run out really long and it's hard to have your body be able to peak at the right times when your seasons are just year after year with hardly any rest so I think now being able to have that break and not competing collegiately um, I think that's really going to help is having my body be more fresh and not run through a whole season already so that's going to make a big difference and it's a weird year though too right I mean yeah just coming off of COVID, not necessarily having the same amount of competitions. Right. You would and, and have you been able to compete against some of the best people in the world on the, on the Paralympic side, or have you not been able to do that yet? Will you just see them in Tokyo? Yep, I'll just see them in Tokyo. Last time I saw them was in Dubai in 2019. So yeah, I just, after that, that's kind of when everything got shut down. And so my first meet in a year was like this last March and I had one meet and then I went to trial. So that's just how I've had two meets in about since COVID started. So. Wow. What's that like psychologically? I mean, how do you, <laughs> does it work? Do you, are you training harder? Do you make your training really purposeful or do you right. need that competition to really sharpen it? Um, I don't think I need the competition. And personally, I think I do pretty well with training and like treating every training practice I have as pretty legit. Um, it was the whole COVID situation was 100% completely 
mentally exhausting. It was hard It just all the motivation kind of was gone for a minute. I had to step away from track for a little bit just because I was so, I was almost just lost because I didn't, I didn't know what I was training for. It was hard to see past COVID, I guess, at that point, if I didn't know exactly what I was training for. But then I sat down with my coach and we talked about everything. I was able to get back into it and it's been good from there. So. So your coach, who is your coach? Are you still working with your college coach? Or are you working independently or how, who's coaching? I, his name is Steve Gordon. He's a coach. He coaches, he has like a local track club and he also helps out at one of the high schools in my area. Um, I found him, I was training by myself one day at the school that he helps out at and he kind of saw me and he knew some of my teammates from my first college that I went to and they reached out to me. And so I kind of found him in that way. And that was right before London in 2017. So it was after nationals in London, I was just transferred. So I just told one school I was leaving and then I was going to transfer to another school. So I was in the middle of not having a coach at that point. So I hadn't found a school. I left my one school, but yeah, he just came and I found him at the right time. Well, he found me basically at the right time. So he's been with me since 2017. And London was your most successful event as well, right? So you won in London and, and, and so you've continued to work with him since then? Yep. So right before he went to London with me, actually. So it was that summer before we left. But yeah, since then, I've been with him solely. Well, I had my college closest coaches as well, and they kind of intermixed everything. They worked well together. And now I'm just solely with Steve. So. And you're only doing long jump at these games, right? Yep. Does that mean, I'd assume that doesn't mean that you're not doing some sprint work in training though? Oh, definitely still doing some sprint work in training, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> that is as far as it goes. <laughs> what's the difference? I mean, it's, I mean, obviously there, there are a lot of differences, but personally, what's the difference for you sprinting versus jumping and does jumping hold something dear to your heart? I just think I've always gone to jumping because that's just what I excelled at the most. And like running, I don't want to say running's fun because I don't, I, I don't enjoy running in general, just like running around the track. Um, I'm more of like, even like my workouts, my coach, we always joke about how straight running on the track is something I absolutely hate. Like I love more of like the power workouts, like hills and stairs. And, but obviously I still got to get that flat running in, but no, I just always stick to long jump because it's really the most what I've excelled in. I mean, in high school, I did the four events type thing with the, um, cause I was still competitive and I was still competitive in high school, but when I got to college, everybody was a lot faster. So kind of just stuck to jumping then. So, so, but that, but that speed you need on the yeah. uh, runway, I mean, that determines how far, I mean, that's a big determining factor of how far you're going to go right no 100 my coach if it was solely up to him he would have me in all the sprinting events he thinks i would be competitive and that he always every single day is like tell you you're a lot quicker than you think like and i just i can't get myself to go back into the straight the solely running events so what do you so when you take a long jump how do you how do you approach it and, and i guess one of the things about long jump too for those who who don't know long jump like you guys always I mean it seems like everybody before you go there's sort of this rocking kind of thing and where you're where you're leaning back and it's not just one person who does it uh, right. so what's the is there a purpose for that why do you why do you do it is a rhythm thing how does it work so for me, I just, it's this routine at this point, but I kind of just use it to get the biggest push I can get. Like I said, I'm more of like a power athlete. So my first few strides are all push and that's where a lot of my speed's going to come from just the power and strength that I have. So I just use that to maximize my power in my first four steps. I feel like getting that extra lean is going to help excel me forward. So. And then you're just, you're just in it, right? And how many steps are you taking? before you get to the board? I take 16. 16 steps. Mm -hmm. Right foot, left foot. I'm a right foot jumper. And, and do you do that based on, does your arm affect which foot you jump off of? See my, it's funny, like my coach and I had just, we just kind of like put this together like this year and we tried. So I jump off my right leg just because 
what did we figure out that I jump off my right leg just be I think because of the arm imbalances so when I jump off my right right my left knee is up and I'm able to drive I'm able to drive my arm that I have but we figured out we think that my power leg is actually my left leg like it's more of my like my stronger leg but I've just been so accustomed of jumping off my right to just be able to drive the arm that I need that and we tried switching in it didn't work out because I'm just not used to it. I've been doing this for years off my right leg. So. So that's just the way it's worked is that you mm -hmm. you're off your right leg now, which, which is interesting. So let's, because you are a basketball player as well in yep. high school. Right. And so, so oftentimes you jump off of the, the opposite foot that you're going to use to shoot. Like if you're doing a layup, right. Yep. Yeah. So is that kind of where it works? So you're jumping off your, but you, but so hold on. How does this work? No, I, I, I got to think about it too. I'm trying to like, so when I jump off my right, I'm using my left for like knee drive. So my left is going to be the one that's up in the air. And I'm like, like that. So. So you would think in some ways, like in basketball, that you would actually jump off of your left foot to then, to then, then do like, like a layup or something. Yeah, I would. Thing. I haven't touched a court since I left high a ball since I left high school, but uh, I, I would think so. But I think when I'm if I was coming, I just know left sided layups were always never the easiest because there's no left hand to use. But <laughs> um, I want to say I don't remember how to shoot a layup <laughs> at this point. It's been so long, so I'm not sure. Now, what did you play in basketball? Because you're tall, right? Five ten. Yeah, about five nine, five ten. I was just kind of like a not like a point guard, just more like of a shooting guard. I would say my strong suits weren't ever actually shooting, but more just driving to the basket, doing all those layups that I don't remember how to do right now. Uh, that was basically my strong suit back then. Um, and then defense was probably what I excelled at the most. Defense and slashing to the to the basket. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did you, how did this all start for you? Like the, the sport part of it, did you get into track first? Did you get into basketball first? Were you, you know, were you in football first or, you know? I think as a kid, I know the three sports I only ever played were soccer, vol not volleyball, soccer, basketball, and track. Those all soccer and track started pretty young just because we have little programs in my hometown um, that include a lot of kids. Um, so I started with that and then I'm pretty sure I got into basketball not too long after like I started track and soccer probably when I was about six seven and then basketball probably just came a few years later um, I guess those are just the sports I wanted to play I'm sure and, and was it just like you know your friends siblings you know kids in the neighborhood or playing and you're like all right this sounds cool or was it probably friends like I didn't have any older siblings like not close older siblings I would have been doing that stuff at that time um so I'm assuming it must have been friends or I just wanted to yeah hang out but I don't really remember that far back but I'm sure my mom would say the same thing they never forced me to do anything so everything I did I wanted to so there was obviously some reason that I did it but it must have been like friends <laughs> everybody must have been doing it do you remember, do you remember enjoying, enjoying sport? Was there, was there a moment when you're like, yeah, like this is, this is what I want to do. Cause effectively you're doing it professionally. Right. Yeah. I've always, I always had that. I've always enjoyed sports. I mean, there was a time where I got super insecure about everything and maybe I didn't enjoy it as much, but I definitely pushed through and got over that. Um, there was, I remember so I switched elementary schools. My first elementary school only went up to third grade. And then I had to switch from fourth to fifth grade in a different school. And I think that's when I became super insecure with everything. So sports got a lot harder because I was always just trying to hide my arm in everything that I did because I was got insecure meeting new people, new school, new everything. Um, but obviously I, had, I outgrew that at some point where it got. Well, I've heard you talk about uh, Rio is being sort of a, a watershed moment in some ways in terms of being comfortable mm -hmm. with yourself 
and right. and so that was that was what you were still you were still in college right when you went to when you that went that was to... after my sophomore year yep or during nope it was after my freshman year going into my sophomore year of school right mm -hmm. and how did that how did that end up working out because I mean in a lot of ways it's easy to be the only person right you're the only person on the court you're the only person on the track who is who's missing an arm but at right. the same time like you were second in the state in long jump right so right you're missing an arm but you're flying further than than anybody else how did how did that work sort of in your mindset and how did how did rio help change the way you looked at yourself right so i i think it all started once i graduated high school like the whole high school i never wore short sleeves anything nobody ever saw my arm in high school um, and then i got to college and i just thought that well college coaches aren't going to take this they're going to tell me to like grow up and get over it like whatever so i just had to so i started going to practices in like short sleeves and obviously i started going to class and like stuff that was showing my arm and over time obviously i was never even my first year, I was never 100% comfortable. I still felt awkward walking into new places, having only one arm. But then I got to Rio and it was just, it was almost eye-opening just seeing everybody being so comfortable in the, with themselves, how they are. It was just inspiring to see, like, I hate being called an inspiration, but like seeing everybody else be so comfortable was so, it helped a lot with the self-confidence, so. It was like, well, they're not worried about it. Why should I? Why am I? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because I mean, certainly for you, because you don't wear a prosthetic at all, do you? Mm -mm. But you look at like the the people who wear leg prosthetics, and and I remember seeing people early on, like when I first, because I had I, I'm in a wheelchair and and I had a, an accident when I was 20 years old, and so suddenly I met people in this world where. I'd yeah. never really known anybody prior to it. And I saw some people who had like, you know, cosmetic legs and stuff where, where it sort of looked like skin tone. And right. one guy who was, it was so funny. Was, he didn't get a cosmetic leg, but it, but it was nowhere near the skin, skin tone. And I was like, <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's helping you at all. But, right. but then you see the people with like the full Terminator looking legs where it's all carbon fiber and it's, you know, steel or alloy or whatever it is. And it's right. like, it's like, wow, that, that looks pretty cool. It right. is, there's sort of an equivalent for you where, where you go, oh, okay, you know, like this is something I've been hiding my whole life, but it could, you know, it's like, I I'm cool. This is, this is who I am. What I bring to it is cool. Exactly. Yeah. I tried prosthetics when I was super young. I just never got into it. I feel like they hurt, they held me back more than it helped me. So I just never got into them. Yeah, no, I would imagine that that is the, that that's part of the case. And, and you're, I, I did see something with your dad where he was saying when you were a little kid, you know, you're, you're sitting there like tying, trying to tie your shoes and he, he tried <laughs> to help you out. Yeah. And he slapped his hand away. Is this the way you've been your whole life? Yeah, I always, I try not to ask. Like, I don't, I've never wanted, I don't ever need help. Um, so I've always just learned to do things myself. And my, I might go about it a different way or it might take me longer, but I'm going to figure out whatever I want to do. So that's kind of just how it's always been. What does that do for you knowing that you're going to figure out a way? Like that you can solve whatever problems in front of you? What, what kind of confidence does that give you? I mean, I don't, I mean, I've been doing this like my whole life. Like I don't, I don't ever see anything as like a, a struggle just because I've just been so accustomed to just doing it without even thinking about it. It might be something new, but I'm going to just go for how I think would work for me. Um, I guess I've never really thought of it as like a confidence thing. Like I can doing it because I have to do it. Like if I want to do it, I'm going to have to do it. So I just kind of, <laughs> do it <laughs> right but a lot of people can look at it and go oh well that seems difficult because i mean that's it's not just because you're missing an arm it's yeah. there there are so many challenges in our lives where we think oh there's no way i can do this but being kind of thrown into it where you're you're missing an arm and in an able-bodied world you have to find a way to make that work 
does that translate to the rest of your life where you're like, that's it. I, I know, I know that I can figure out how to make whatever it is work, whatever I have to do. You know, I wish it did, but no, I don't think, I don't think it really does. Like when it comes to like certain things and trying to figure out how to work certain things and any other aspect, I'm not very good at that. I'm not, no, I don't have the confidence to do just, I don't know. I don't think it translates at all for me. I don't think I've never thought about it like that, but I should probably start thinking about it like that. It might help myself out a little bit. It seems like it because I mean the thing is you've you've definitely you've figured figured a lot out and figured out how to I mean what was it like to be second in the state in in the long jump in high school was that was that just an eye opening experience for you for the people around you or was that a, what you expected It's kind of just what I almost expected I don't really think it was I mean other people might have thought it was like eye-opening but for me I'm more figuring out how can I get to be first like why am I second <laughs> not first like, I just need to jump a little bit farther and I can get first so I just thought I kind of just knew like I knew all throughout high school I had I was pretty decent at long jumps so just waiting just wanted to be first but <laughs> do you remember how much you lost by at the state meet yeah, I think it was like six inches. I think six or seven. I think I came in to stay with the longest jump too, and then didn't. Oh, you did. So you were really, so, so you were expected to win and everybody else thought that you were expected to win as well. Right. Yeah. So that's how that one went. A silver, I'm in a senior year full of silver, so for basketball and track, but happy with it. Oh, really? So you were second in basketball as well? Mm-hmm. Senior year we were. What was the what was the step up like to college when you left high school and went to college? You said everybody was faster on the track and the running events, but was it the same in jumping as well where it challenged you a lot? It did, definitely. Especially when I started out in college, I went D1. And it just put me from like the top of the ranks to like almost the bottom. Like every meet was just, am I going to make it to finals this meet or am I just going to, yeah, it was tough, but it was also motivation to get better. Um, so it was, a, it was a change for sure. Well, that's, I mean, but that's, that's where you get better too, isn't it? Where you go as far as you think you can go. And then you look around and go, wow, I thought I went really far. And these women are going way further. Further, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you maintain that? I mean, how did you maintain that kind of a mentality during during COVID? Like keeping your your training so purposeful. It was hard. Like I said, I had to step away from the track for a month or two, just because I didn't have any motivation. I couldn't see past COVID. I couldn't see. I just didn't have any motive. I didn't know what I was training for. I didn't know, like, I'm doing all this work, but for what? We're not going to have meets for a year. And so it was hard. It was physically, emotionally, mentally exhausting that whole COVID time. But I was honest with my coach about it. And I kind of opened up about it all to him. And he was the one who really was like, Clea, this is like kind of normal. Every athlete probably goes through this at some point. Like, and we're going through this new pandemic thing that nobody's ever experienced before. Um, so like it's completely understandable you do what you need to do and like we'll get back to work in like a month or so so he let me have the time off that I really needed to get everything back mentally and physically so he was it was super I'm glad I opened up to him and told him everything that was going on so which was probably you know probably really the first time you'd had time off right since you were since you were a kid certainly since you were in high school Right, for sure. And I, like you said, it was probably much needed. And that's what's super nice about being out of college now is I finally have the rest time that I need because rest is important as an athlete too. You can definitely overwork yourself, overtrain yourself. Um, yeah, it was super, I mean, it was definitely what I needed at the time. So. And you're, but you're jumping well now. So mm -hmm. you had to gain some purpose, right? When you, you took the time off, 
what was the purpose that you gained? Was it knowing that the games were going to happen or how did that, how did that work? How did, how did you make your training purposeful? I think it was just knowing that the game, that it was probably the games that they were coming back. And now that I have something again to work for, that's like not, cause we didn't know for a while if it was canceled or like postponed or whatever. So if it was like canceled and I have another three years, to go ahead and train and that would have been that would have hit me hard too but knowing that it's still within a good time frame like within a year I mean kind of just the love of the sport like I wasn't ready to fully like give it up yet so it's just like I think the love of the sport really probably is what brought me back to it after stepping away for a little bit but then you said at trials that was your that was your biggest jump at a para event mm-hmm how, how much further have you gone at an able-bodied event at a college event? So my, I've went throughout college. I went 559. 559. So that's a big difference. Yeah. I'm not wow. sure. I don't know why I, I consistently jumped in the, in the fifties in high school, not high school in college. And then, but then again, I think I said, I don't think I was able ever to, relay that to a uh, pair me just because the pair meets always happened in the summer. And so I had to extend my training after working two full seasons, indoor, outdoor, which was kind of hard. So that's why I think that worked out to jump as well as I did in trials was just because um, I hadn't had a full season. So like now if we can set up the peak at trials and like peak in Tokyo, that's what the goal is. So. That's so you must be really excited then looking at Tokyo thinking this is your chance. I mean, if you've gone five, five, nine mm -hmm. to think, I mean, it's not very far to go five, six. Yeah, I know. Something you never, you've never done, right? Right. I'm super excited. And the way training's looking and everything, I just hope it all works out when I need it to do. Are you going to are you going to share any kind of an expectation for any or a goal for, for Tokyo? No, you're not going to share anything. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, I want the biggest goal is obviously winning. Like, I don't I don't have a certain number in mind because it's all going to be depend on the day. Like we could all have we, all the competitors could have like bad days. And so their jumps aren't going to be the winning jump could be something that it's not very far as what we're used to, you know? So um, obviously winning podium for sure. Those are going to be my goals. So how does it work? Cause you get six jumps, right? And are you, cause some people, some people jump better earlier. Some people jump better later. How, mm -hmm. how does that work for you? And what's the, is there a game of it? Like, you know, let's get a good jump on our first jump. So we have something and then we can go bigger or how do you approach the strategy of it? So my strategy is usually um, get one, get one to make you have you make finals. Um, that's how it's always been. So just get one off the board and that should be good enough to get you finals and then we'll scoot you up so you can or scoot you back so you can push a little harder and come a little harder down the runway. Once I get the first mark in knowing that I'm not going to like foul. Um, that's usually when we start pushing a little more after I get the first jump in. So my best jumps usually come in the middle or later in the series. So, so scooching back, are you then taking a lot, you're taking the same number of steps, but you're taking a longer run into the board? Is that, that just, when I scoop back, it just means I can push harder. Um, it just gives me more power to be, so I don't, so I'm not over when I get to the board. So if I scoop back, I'm able to push a little bit harder in my first four steps. I'm still going to be 16. I just, I'm able to go a little harder. But, but is the, is the distance from the board, do you increase the distance from the board? Is that what you mean? Like the distance of your runway that you're okay. running? In? Yeah. Yeah. I'm increasing that distance. Sorry. Okay. Increasing your distance. So, so you get one where it's a little bit shorter. Is that harder though? I mean, if you're going a little bit shorter and you're trying to match your steps, then you're trying to match your speed so that your steps all work out. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, and it's like having done it so much, it's just, I just have it down to a science. So it's like, I know, if, depending on where like my mark is, I know what I need to do to not foul at the board. So like, 
So my first one, we're gonna be, just to get one on the board, we're gonna be, my last few steps are gonna be a little shorter and a little quicker, just so I know I don't foul one to get off of the board. And then when it comes to like, when I'm able to get one off the board, I'm able to scoop back and push a little harder. They're still gonna be short and quick, but it's not gonna be as rushed. I was gonna be more um, comfortable, not comfortable, that's not the right word. It's gonna be more natural. It's gonna be more natural, natural. and rhythmical. Yeah. Because that second to last step is, is a big change as well, right? Where you're creating your angle of your jump and that second to last step where you're kind of- Yeah, you're loading up for the jump. You're gearing to get up, right. yeah. Dropping your hips down, loading up and then- Flying. Flying. What, yes. is, <laughs> what does flying feel like? Oh, I wish it would last longer. Um, it's. I don't even know how to explain. It goes so fast. Like if I, w I always tell my coach that I wish I could just like slow down the time in the air, especially when we're working on technique, just slow down the time. I wish I could do like a slow mo and just move my body pieces to where they need to be because it happens so fast. So that's why it's hard to like from full approach, it's hard to fix certain things because you're going so fast that the time in the air feels so short that you don't it's hard to feel what you need to feel when the time is so short. Um, but yeah, the feeling itself is just kind of hard to describe because you're not there for very long. But there's so. so much that you have to do as well, right? I mean, it's jumping off the board, it's driving, driving that knee, driving that arm mm -hmm. in order to get both up so that you can, so that you can drift as far as you can. Right. I know that's where in practice, it really helps to do what helps for me is to practice like short approach jumps. So I don't have as much speed and it's a lot with the, without all the speed, it's a lot easier to feel what you need to feel to get your body in the right positions. Um, so we practice from short approach a lot. So it's not too fast because the fast part is, is trying to get everything together at the same time so that it works. Right. It's and it's it's almost like your power part too, right? If it's shorter, it's almost like your jump is more power than it is sort of speed. Yeah, a hundred percent. Do you do, which I'd imagine you do, do jumps off the box and things like that as well too, right? To be in we the- We don't do any jumps off the box just because it's almost like we don't, I personally, I don't like the illusion. The box is going to make you feel, I understand there's benefits to it, but with the box, it just makes me, it's hard to go from feeling like I'm really up and getting off the box and feeling like I'm literally floating in the air to coming back off the box and going off. It just gives me a false illusion. It makes me, it just, it's hard to go from jumping off a box to jumping back on the, just the straight runway for me because the illusion of the box makes it feel so big where then it's going to compare to off, it's going to feel like nothing afterwards. So I don't jump off the box. I just personally don't like it. But you don't like it. The mm -mm. Yeah, going back makes it feel like gravity is so much more. Like just like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes me feel like I'm not getting up at all. So now how you've been doing this, because I mean you're still you're still young, but you've been doing it for a while, right? And so and you've been to two worlds, you've been to a Paralympics. Do you know who all the other players are? Do you have like a close relationship with these people? Do you, when you get there, you're like, okay, this is, this is who I'm targeting. Yeah. So I know, I know all my competitors. I know everybody I'm competing against because it's been the same people for the past few years. Um, and we're all pretty friendly. There's no bad blood. There's never been, the other girls are super, super friendly. Um, but yeah, it's just nice. I mean, it's, it is nice. Sometimes it's hard because I'm like, I just want to win. <laughs> and then, but yeah, no, they're all super friendly. We're all, so it's nice knowing everybody. Um, Does that make it a little bit easier just to know everybody that you go in and you're like, okay, I know, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know who's going to be here. There won't be any surprises. And hopefully you have a surprise because you haven't had right even you're not tired coming into it you're fresh and ready right no it's super it makes it super comfortable um i know just comparing rio to like all the other experiences i've had afterwards 
um, just be knowing ever it makes it so much easier, I think, because I know everybody. Um, they're all super friendly. We can chit chat while we're going and um, just the comfortability of it all is super nice. What will it be like that you don't have any fans? Will that be will that be disappointing? Will that be a change? It'll be a change. Um, but to me, I'm not big on all that type of stuff anyways. It's not to me. I don't know if it technically makes a difference. I think I honestly would do better alone. Um, but I'm not, I'm just not big into, I don't know why I've just never been big into crowds or big into even like attention in general. Attention is something I've had to learn to come to terms with because I just always wanted to not be in the spotlight almost, but. Which is a little bit interesting in some ways, right? You're gonna have to stick with me on this because because with your name, right? I mean, your name, what, what some of the translations of your name are like morning dew, origin, popularity? I have no idea. You had no idea. <laughs> no. I started doing some research and it popped up for some reason, like definitions, you know? And I'm like, popularity, yeah. wow, okay, like this is an interesting one. I so. have no idea. <laughs> if it does, then maybe I'm coming into it, but as for now, I'm not there yet, so. Not there yet. Do you feel like you jump further, like in practice? I mean, are you a practice jumper? You can go and jump. You don't need that excitement of competition, somebody next to you kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Me and my coach were just talking last week. Like, if we could have the Olympics at my studio, at where I practice, it would be a no-brainer. I'm so I – just, I just thrive in, like, comfortability. Like, I just – I'm comfortable around is with my, with no one basically. So in like places I'm familiar with and everybody would probably say the same thing, but um, yeah, well, definitely a practice jumper. I do very well in practice. Really? And if you jump to the, does that mean that you've thrown down bigger jumps in practice than you have in competition? Yeah. I get the good ones where it doesn't ever count. So Yeah. Wow. Now, how do you, how do you take that from, from the practice track, from the pit to Tokyo? That's what we're trying, trying to figure out. Like, obviously I know it's not like a confidence thing is obviously I know I can jump that far. I've done it before. I know my body can do it. It just comes down to doing it on the day that's how it always has been. It's like, if I could just, all it takes is one jump where everything has to be put together perfectly. That's all it takes is one jump. And another problem I've had is like, we're fixing all these little tweaking, all these little minor, minor things. Um, and they just all need to come together at one jump. I'm um, not one at one time. And then the next jump, I fix this other thing, but forget about the first one I had fixed. Um, it's all just a matter of, the day and how I feel that day, I guess. Um, obviously, I know I can do it because I, I know I can. So, well, I mean, not that you know you can. You've done it, so that makes it right. a whole lot easier to know that you that you can right. do it, right? Yeah, for sure. Do you have Do you have any kind of a trigger or anything that that sort of signifies comfort or any way that you can create a comfortable environment in a different place or I'm making you think about different stuff again aren't I yeah <laughs> yeah and I would say the only thing that would be able to do that would probably be my coach being there that would be the only point of comfortability that I would have somewhere new um but other than that I don't know and will he be there mm -mm. no nope yeah, it is super, super strict right now. I mean, you couldn't, in previous years, maybe you could have had your coach there, but yeah, this one. Like he was in London and Dubai. So I'm sure if it was a normal year, he would have been able to go. Right, exactly. So, so no crowds are a good thing for you. No coach, unfortunately, is, is a bad thing for you. 
but you're getting you're getting all that stuff in now where i would imagine you're doing all your training and and right. everything and and bringing as much of your coach with you as you possibly can so right. what about do, do you enjoy the travel part of it do you enjoy going someplace different and getting to see some different things, but you won't get a chance to see much, unfortunately, at this one, right? No. Um, the crazy thing is I had no desire to travel before I started doing para. Um, I had always told my mom I would never leave in the country. <laughs> like, I just had no desire to see anything else. But then once I started, like after I went to Rio and then London, Peru, Dubai, now, yeah, I love traveling. Not the traveling process, like obviously on the planes, but like being in other countries, it's super, it's surreal to me just to see, it just blows my mind seeing that other people actually live somewhere other than here. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. I don't know. Wow. And, and you've seen some pretty diverse kinds of, uh, kinds of cultures too. I mean, being in Rio, being in Peru, being in London, you mm -hmm. know, Tokyo, you know, you'll get to see some of it, I would imagine. I mean, it seems like, I mean, the Japanese seem like they, they are so, you know, so proud of who they are and, and want to want to be able to share with you who right. they are. So I'm sure they'll find a way to to make it feel like you're in Japan when you're right. actually in Japan. So right. so you have the bug though, you have that travel bug and and it, it's not just travel bug to go compete, it's travel bug to go see. Go oh, anywhere, yeah. <laughs> Definitely what places because the thing is I mean you're so young and in your career in a lot of ways you're in the middle of it but in a lot, in a lot of ways you're in the beginning of your career too mm -hmm. are there any places that are kind of on your bucket list places that you want to go that you want to visit Greece Greece, I want to go to Greece so bad mm -hmm. yeah and why why Greece just the I guess the, everything that I've seen of Greece just looks so pretty. The water, I love water. I love being by the water. Everything just looks so relaxing and so nice. And I just live for relaxing by, on some sand by the water. So that's like my favorite thing to do in the heat. I love all that. That is funny. Cause I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about the ocean, you're talking about the, you know, the Mediterranean or whatever, you know, the sea, but you're, you're fairly landlocked there in Nebraska. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I didn't choose to live here. I stayed here. I did choose to stay here, but I know I did. The winter is my least favorite season. Um, the snow, I, I cannot do the cold. I'm just a person like we've been, it's been super hot out recently here. Like it's 90 degrees with hundred percent humidity. So it feels like 106 over here today in the last few days and everybody's complaining. I'm like, this is nice. <laughs> I love, I just love the heat. Like, I don't know. I just, and I hate being cold and I'm always cold. So. Well, it's also doing what you do. It's so explosive that you want your muscles to be loose as well like that heat helps you to right loose muscles too right for sure it definitely helps a lot and i think it's going to be nice because i've heard that tokyo apparently is like hot and humid I'm like i've been training hot and humid all all summer so i don't think it's going to be anything new to me we're in 100 percent humidity right now basically so so you're saying bring it like as as hot as you can make it as humid as you can make it like bring it this is it i love it I'm here for a yep. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> wow. So have you been watching the Olympics as well? Uh, not too much. No, I've seen like the highlights. I know track just started today. It should start today over there today. But so now I'll probably tune in a little more. But to watch the track. Mm -hmm. have, did you did you catch any of the opening or not? Mm -mm. No. And do you think that you'll go to the opening in Tokyo? No. Mm, probably not. Okay. And that's that's to save yourself for your event or? Probably. And again, I don't, I don't know. Like it'd be something cool to experience, but that's not something Talia would like to do. That's not something that, I don't know. It's just, it's really not me. Like it'd be a super cool experience. Yes. 
but I just don't, I didn't do it in Rio. And that was really to preserve myself because I competed like the first day, but this time I'm not sure when the opening ceremony even is date wise, but yeah, probably just something I won't do. <laughs> no, there's not really a reason on that, but. Nice. So is there anything special you're planning as you, as you go to Tokyo or are you, is there any kind of a, like a celebration, family send off before you leave? Any, any way you're, you're kind of commemorating it on the, on the way there? Or no, no, we don't have anything planned. When they announced the team, um, we kind of did something then that was super exciting to have my family and friends around. Um, but other than that, maybe when I come back, but a welcome back party or something, I don't know. Well, if hopefully all, you have some, well, yeah. <laughs> hopefully you have some hardware when you come back too, right? Yeah. That's the yes. Hopefully. That is the objective. And and I'm assuming Tokyo is not the end for you. Are you are you looking to Paris as well? Or are you just not even looking that far? Yeah, I probably I want to go to 20. I want to do it in LA. Okay. If my if I'm gonna make it that far, I don't know. Um, but for sure, probably Paris, just because now it's only three more years away since we pushed everything back a year. So that's not another whole, that's not another full cycle. Um, but then hopefully, I just think competing at LA would be so, I would love that. To be able to compete at home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be awesome for me. I would love every bit of that. But if I make it that far, I'm not sure. I'll be older you'll be older point. but what i mean you'll be like 30 31 yeah 31 probably <laughs> so we'll see which which might sound old to you now but doesn't really it's, in reality yeah uh, it's not old but who knows where i'll be with life at that point career wise family wise we'll see and and you said you've been working a lot as well right what are you doing for work I work for an eye doctor, so I'm an optometrist technician. Um, so we've just been super busy with school picking back up recently, or school about to be coming. Everybody's trying to get their eye exams in. And we're just low on numbers right now, too. So I've been having to work a little bit more. And is that something that you'll you'll continue your education as well? Like Once I figure out what I want to do, yeah but that's not necessarily what you want to do you don't want to go into being an mm. optometrist or no but i know i want to be somewhere health medical related i just don't necessarily know what and i probably will have to go back to school for whatever i want to do um but hopefully it just pops up one day what i want to do so i don't know that type of stuff stresses me out thinking about it which is no yeah. need to stress you out right now. You need to be as comfortable as possible as you can <laughs> Tokyo, right? This is the, right. Maybe when you're not thinking about it, that long plane ride home or something, you know? Maybe that's right. who knows. <laughs> that's the that's the point. Because <laughs> that is going to be a long plane ride. Well, mm -hmm. Talia, thank you so much for joining us and good luck. And thank you. Yeah, keep training hard. Always. Well, thank you. And, and thank you to all of you for tuning in. If you didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing, it'll be archived on the One Revolution page on Facebook. We also will edit this, this podcast down for YouTube, for Spotify, for Apple, for all the usual suspects. The greatest gift you can give us is to tell your friends, to tell your friends to tune in, to like us, to follow us. So thanks again, Talia. And we'll be watching you. Go, all right, appreciate it. Bye, <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks.